You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to Tea Break Time Travel, where every month we look at a different archaeological object and take you on a journey into their past. Hello and welcome to episode 19 of Tea Break Time Travel. I am your host, Matilda Siebrecht. Today I am savouring a rooibos mint chocolate tea because it is pretty much like two days after Christmas. I realise when we're recording this that it's going to be released like two days after Christmas. So I'm still in the holiday spirit (laughs) a little bit with that. And joining me on my tea break today is Teya Nakamura, a.k.a. TK, who you may recognize the name because she was featured in my newsletter recently as the host of the amazing podcast, For the Love of History. Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, TK. Um, and are you also on a hot beverage today? I do. I have a hot beverage. It's been a crazy week. So I am imbibing in chamomile tea with a splash of honey. <laughs> <laughs> One of those weeks. I, I get it. <laughs> I get it. But and, and because you are based in Japan, is Japan yes. a large tea drinking culture? It's one of those things... I I don't actually know. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a super big tea drinking culture. Most people, I think, are familiar with like matcha tea. Which yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's Japanese, (laughs) right? I mean, yes, of course, that's Japanese. Says me, alleged tea expert. (laughs) Okay, okay, okay. Good to know. Cut that part out. It's totally fine. So yeah, that's uh, one of the most famous teas, but actually people here don't drink it every day. The most popular tea in Japan, I would say during the summertime is barley tea. And when I was on the train, I was drinking some barley tea. Green tea is super popular here. There's all sorts of different kinds of green tea. And if you go to any little small town in Japan, they will always say, we have the best green tea here in blah, blah, right. blah. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you can get a little mug to prove it. Yeah. So, best tea in Japan. Yeah, fair enough. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's barley tea. I mean, is that just a way of saying that you're drinking a nice hot beer? Or <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I mean, what does that taste so, like? I'm just curious. <laughs> it's the most interesting flavor of tea that I've ever had. When I first moved here, I did kendo, which is like a Japanese sword fighting, kind of. <gasps> which, and okay, we're coming back to that, but yes, cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I did Japanese sword fighting, and usually for like sports things, people drink this barley tea, and at first I mm-hmm. absolutely hated it. But as it's like super stinking hot, like 32 degrees Celsius. I don't know how many degrees Fahrenheit that is. I I am a terrible American, (laughs) but uh, (laughs) I'm sweating in this like heavy, heavy gear with this helmet and these gloves. And basically any sort of cold beverage was preferable to dying. So uh, I quickly came to love this barley tea that Hmm. tastes like if you smelled a bag of like barley, uh-huh. but took out the alcohol, does that make sense? Huh. I think so. Like hoppy, almost sort of not really hoppy though. A little like, bit hoppy. Yeah. yeah. A little bit hoppy, Ooh. but then it's like grainy at the same time, like wheat almost. It's like those biscuits. Yeah. I think we get them here. We get these like biscuits here, like wheat biscuits. Barley, I think there might even be barley biscuits actually. So I guess it's like that, but in a tea. That's so interesting. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's really good. Oh, <laughs> if I ever, if I ever make it over to Japan, I will make sure to <laughs> look out some barley tea. Well, and okay, Please. you just happen to to slip in there casually that you do Japanese sword fighting. So is this yes. something you still do? How did you How did you get into that? So I don't do it anymore uh, because I don't have. I sa- I feel so silly saying this, but this is what it's called a dojo close by to me (laughs) but when I was when I first moved here I you know was young 22 uh, just turned 23 year old brand new teacher and I was trying to like make friends with the other teachers and also connect with my students. And I decided to pick Kendo, which is Japanese sword fighting because I thought it looked really, really cool. And the teacher was really nice. And it also helped me practice my Japanese. So I did 
I practiced for about four years and then I made it to a level called, it's called Shodan, which Uh is the level right after the beginner level. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, no. It's fine. You made it to Shodan. Whoa, Shodan. Okay. I know, right? (laughs) You made it to that level? Oh my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) But right after the beginner, the important word there is after the beginner level. See, so you're above, you're above the beginner. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> very cool oh that's very cool i used to i did sword fighting at uni not japanese sword fighting i did like it was medieval <gasps> european sword that's fighting so cool. it was really so cool. fun but also it's I such know. a workout like you True. do it you think oh this is going to be really cool and really well really cool <laughs> that shows how nerdy i am but um <laughs> <It's really cool. laughs> this is going to be really cool doing sword fighting and everything but my goodness lifting a, i mean i don't know how much they probably only weigh like a kilo or something but still lifting and swinging around and doing things and you have to do it at arm's length and do all these yeah. other things and it's yeah my arms the day after were killing me which, uh, yeah exactly exactly but it's great for your posture so yes <laughs> yeah and core core strength so maybe i should try and do it again i yeah. mean I'm not, sure, I'm not sure they have one in the tiny little german village that i live in they don't, don't have so <laughs> maybe i should start one they have a table tennis club so <laughs> 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 it's similar right <laughs> and, yeah. and you mentioned uh that you are trained as a teacher but uh, yeah. and you you worked as a history teacher for a while as well then because i imagine you are interested in, in history. Um, uh, in you know, I hate it so much. Uh, <laughs> how, how did that start? How did the, the, the interest in that particular topic start? So I, I, I was like a, a history hater because my dad is an absolute history lover, just a history buff. And every oh. family vacation that we ever went on, it was always always history themed and so we'd get dragged to these battlefields and we'd get dragged to these memorials and things like that my brother and I are always like dad can't we go to a theme park like everybody else <laughs> dad was like, no it's good for you turns out he was right it is good for us <laughs> Yeah, so my dad is really fascinated with military history but he also loves pirates he loves pirates and once I think I was in junior high school and I I finally made the connection that pirates are a part of history. And I was <sighs> like, Dad, why did you not tell me pirates are history? I thought war was the only thing about history. He was like, no, no. no." And at the time we lived in Virginia. And so he took me to the Blackbeard Festival. And I was like, oh, wow. This was amazing. (laughs) So that, that started my, my love of history was, was pirates. Pirates. My dad. Yeah. Which, yeah, it's funny. If they had a, I guess, yeah. I, for some reason, I always think of pirates as being quite a European thing, because I guess I mm-hmm. think of all those films where they have the like strong Somerset accent of like, oh, yes, laddie, you know, and it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, he obviously was a farmer from the like East country <laughs> in, in an earlier life. But I guess actually there's the Pirates of the Caribbean famous, mm-hmm. famously set in Central America. Mm-hmm. And there's probably lots of pirates based in, oh, based yeah. in America. <laughs> yeah. American pirates. There's Japanese pirates, Chinese pirates, so yeah. many different types of pirates. So yeah. pirates cool. were my historical gateway drug <laughs> fair well and how lucky we are that you were introduced to pirates because otherwise we might never have uh, your wonderful podcast which indeed i think i've listened to your episode about japanese is it japanese pirates i did one episode i have yet to do an episode on japanese pirates which i really need to but i did do an episode on a chinese pirate who is yes, arguably pirate. the greatest <sighs> pirate of all time and she's a lady yeah, 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 which funnily enough, I listened to that one and then I listened to another podcast, You're Dead to Me, and they featured the same person. And I was like, I already know all this because I listened to DK's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it, was fun. it was fun to hear things. And as of course, this is a time travel podcast. Yeah. If you could travel back in time, apart from to the Fire, uh, not Firebeard Festival, Blackbeard <laughs> Festival, if you could travel back in time, where would you go and why? Ooh, I would go back to the Yayoi period in Japan, which is around the like one to four hundreds. 
And this is the period like after the like prehistoric period of Japan when there are kingdoms forming and it, it there's an empress called Empress Himiko who is kind of like an Arthurian character Ooh. who maybe she was a real person, maybe she wasn't a real person and if she was a real person, she would be Japan's first centralized ruler and mm-hmm. That has many a historian up in arms because the Japanese history is quite patriarchal, as a lot of history is. Mm-hmm. So having the first empress of Japan be uh, a woman mm-hmm. be like freaking crazy. So, oh. yeah. Oh. But, is really it, but, it's, but it's still like a matter of de- debate, like as if people haven't looked into it much or, or are they just no, not no, no. ready? People right? have... Yeah, people have looked into it. There's not hardly any records from the Japanese perspective because Japan at that time, their only written records were on like turtle shells and rocks and stones and stuff like that. But Uh -uh. China was doing a lot of trade with Japan and in China's like primary sources, their their records at the time, they talk about the kingdom of Wa being the, the land of the this one queen. So it wasn't an emperor. It was an empress. And also she's in Japan's semi-historical, semi-mythological records called the Nihon Shoki. And it's like the oldest written record in Japan. So she's also in there, but there's no like archeological evidence of her and that's the thing that people are like gotcha no archaeological <laughs> evidence about her just written evidence but it was like a few Which thousand years it ago doesn't exist. yeah exactly <laughs> well if we haven't found it clearly it didn't exist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well no that is really interesting and also if she was empress of the whole of japan at that like what we know mm-hmm. of as japan at that point that's a pretty big actual area to be especially at that time period to be yeah well she wasn't she if she was real she wouldn't have been the empress of the whole of all of japan so so sorry okay. I, I, uh, for that confusion, but at That's the time, to be honest, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know absolutely nothing about the history of a lot of Asian countries, especially Japan. That's um, okay. So, yeah. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it was like the biggest group that had formed in Japan at that time. So okay. there were like, there were little, little groups and she would have been in charge of the biggest of the little groups. <laughs> okay. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, interesting. Well, yeah, indeed. That's, I mean, that's a great answer. That sounds like a fascinating person to go back and then, you know, make sure to take a camera with you. Take of a course. picture. <laughs> say, yes. well, here we go. Here's your archaeological <laughs> <preliminary>. <laughs> <laughs> Or does he ask her to bury like a little time capsule? Or something. Yeah. yeah. It's like, <laughs> I was here. <laughs> but, uh, On a small like rock. You. Yes, yeah, yeah. real. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Little selfie, engraved selfie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me on my tea break today. Very excited to have you here. And before so we look at more detail at today's object, let's first journey back to the 1700s. This is, I think, the shortest journey we've ever made. Last <laughs> month, we went to the 1100s, and I was thinking, wow, this is so short. Now we're going to the 1700s. I mean, goodness. Um, <laughs> to that cluster of islands that we call Japan. It's spring. The hills are covered with the soft pink color and the sweet perfume of the cherry blossom. We're in a small town, walking along the dusty main road, admiring the flared roofs, the hanging murals, the sliding doors opening into wide, friendly rooms. Several people are walking past. We take a moment to watch them, admiring the colorful drape of the clothing, the loosely knotted hairstyles. One of the men pauses, reaching down to his belt and patting the sash around his waist with a sudden expression of mild panic. His fingers touch a small, simple box hanging by a cord, which is tucked into his sash and kept in place by what looks like a wooden ball. On closer inspection, however, we see that it is not in fact a ball, but a very sweet, intricately carved, curled up rabbit. Looking relieved, the man touches the box at the rabbit one last time, gives a nod, then hurries on after his companions. So today we are looking at something called, now let me see if I can pronounce this correctly, Netsuke? Netsuke? Mm -hmm, Good job. (laughs) And uh, we'll get into the details soon, uh, but first we're going to have a very quick break. So talk to you in a minute. 
Welcome back, everybody. So something that I usually like to do uh, in these episodes is look at the most asked questions on the internet about this object, courtesy of Google search, (laughs) in order to see what other people might want to know about the objects that we talk about. Sometimes this yields very few results, which I'm always slightly disappointed in because people apparently Mm -hmm. don't know about these objects, but actually (laughs) have, have a lot of questions about them. So that's quite nice. And seeing as we have TK here, I thought this is the perfect time to find the, the answers to all of your burning questions. So <laughs> the first question actually was Netsuka pronunciation, which we've we've dealt with. That's that's done. Yeah. But the second question is, what does Netsuka actually mean? And I have seen on your Instagram that you've been acing all of your Japanese exams. So I imagine <laughs> you'll, you'll be able to tell us. <laughs> yeah. So Netsuke so is made up of two different kanji, ne and tsuke. So ne is not often used it is a kanji that means root and then ske is used quite often like skeru as the verb which means to affix so it's a root one uses to affix different things interesting Mm -hmm. which relates a little bit because i sort of mentioned it slightly in the in the time travel segment but indeed how i was also really curious when i first saw these amazing things so uh, mm-hmm. that the uh, mm-hmm. in in the museum somewhere and i was thinking what are these these are so cool and i had never mm-hmm. heard of them before and i was really struggling to work out how they were worn <laughs> but <laughs> was, was i correct <laughs> in my time travel sometimes i'm correct in these things and sometimes the guest goes yeah so not really this is actually <laughs> what it's <laughs> but so do you know how they were worn or how they would have been used yeah, yeah. So basically, the netsuke works in one of two ways. So one, it's a counterweight for the little bag that's called sagemono. So kimonos are beautiful, and they are amazing, and I love to wear them. Mm-hmm. However, the the men of the Edo period, which is the time period that we're talking about right now, suffer from the same fashion tragedy that women often face now, which is a lack of pockets. Oh. <laughs> Bane of my life. Right? <laughs> the feeling of finding a dress that you like that has pockets. There's right. Have you seen all those like memes it? which it's like, and it has pockets. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so okay. in, in lieu of pockets, most Japanese men who were of some sort of affluence, which we can talk about that a little bit later, had a sagemono. Sagemono is like a little pouch. Sometimes it was a little box and it was attached to the netsuke, which was attached to a little string. And so the netsuke was either tucked through the sash called an obi Mm -hmm. and used as like a little stopper, like a little counterweight to stop Mm -hmm. the sagemono from like falling out. Mm -hmm. Or there was another type of netsuke, which was more like a little hook. So if you just imagine like a fish hook, but Uh way more pretty. (laughs) 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 that would hang from the inside would hang on the little obi and yeah that's that's how they were used interesting which actually Mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense are they like are they still used in that way today as well because that seems very practical yeah they're super practical so there is a very small community of people in japan that still wear kimono on a daily basis and usually they are in the entertainment industry as in like Uh, they do either tourist thingies where mm. they you know put people in kimono or they do tea ceremonies or something like that some Uh kimono sellers wear kimono every day some people that work at very high-end japanese restaurants will Uh wear kimono not as their daily attire but as their work attire but there are some people Mm. who do wear kimono every day Oh, huh. okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And then so also those have people to... still use them. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's very cool. Oh, nice. So they're also still still being made as well. They are still being made. There are few, you know, traditional craftsmen and, and women now, but it's actually, it's so interesting because there is a traditional art school in in Kyoto that is responsible for training a bunch of different 
craftspeople in traditional Japanese art. Uh And there is a Netsuke department at that university in Kyoto. And a A lot of people. Wow. There's a (laughs) department. (laughs) Wow. Okay. (laughs) So a lot of foreign people, a lot of people who are not Japanese will come to this university to learn these traditional arts, which is super duper cool. Interesting. Oh, so it is also Mm -hmm. open because I'm I don't know. I'm thinking of, for example, the Maori culture where you have the, oh, what are they called? The p- power necklaces. And uh-huh. it, technically only a Maori craftsperson is allowed to carve the jade power. Like anyone can do the bone yeah. one, but only a Maori is allowed mm. to do the, the jade. Is so, But that's not the case in Japan. There's also not a kind of taboo with materials or anything like that. Yeah, no. So Japan has a really interesting culture of where people are just excited that you're excited about Japanese stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really cool. So there's even with, you know, like religious things, people are very open about sharing that. Not all people, granted, mm-hmm. but there are no like rules against people who are not Japanese learning all aspects of Japanese culture. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, and I'm really, I mean, I need to look up this, this, I'm going to find it and put it in the show notes, this uh, department of <laughs> yeah. uh, carving. Yeah. That's yeah. incredible. But there's so it's, like, it's really cool. So it's like the carving department and within the carving department, there is the Netsuke department. <laughs> wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So you can, anybody can enter into this university, but the only caveat is you have to speak Japanese. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which, is quite a yeah (laughs) yeah although to be fair i went to school in australia for a while and there the two options were french or japanese which because i guess it's it's equally close to both (laughs) lands right so uh, it was uh, so i did do one year of japanese when i was like 13 but i can't remember (laughs) <laughs> what can I, I'm trying to think now if I can remember any phrase. Remember Den, Denwa Bangoa? Ah, like- Denwa Bangoa! What's yeah. your number? Exactly. <laughs> Which sounds really sus that that's the only phrase I can remember, but I swear <laughs> it's very innocent. It's just because we have to learn all of the, you know, what's your name? Where do you come from? And then yeah. weirdly, what's your telephone number? Because apparently that's yeah. very important. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so, and I can check out, what was it? Ichi ni san shi go roku. Yeah. Uh, Hachi Nana. Oh, I can't so close. The rest. Nana uh, Hachi, you're so Nana close. Hachi. Ah. You did a great job. <laughs> Which, you know, is a really important message, everyone listening in who can't speak Japanese. That was, you know, prophet, uh, <laughs> prophecy, uh, really <laughs> philosophical. It wasn't me just counting very badly today. <laughs> anyway, back to the Netsuka. So unfortunately, anyone who's interested in carving, the, or learning about carving, they will indeed have to, to speak Japanese, which, you know, if yeah. you're really interested in learning about the culture, that's essential anyway, I would argue, uh, in, mm-hmm. in knowing kind of a bit about it. And so they're still made today, but are they, I guess, because they've been around for so long. I mean, I imagine they were even around before the 1700s. That was sort of a random date that I picked because it seemed to be Mm -hmm. within the period that they did exist. But I guess they were around for even longer. I mean, are they considered sort of valuable today because of that? Like, is it, or is it just sort of something that it's like, oh yeah, it's like a belt buckle or something, you know, it's just a a functional item. Yes. And No. So, (laughs) so, um, (laughs) there are some Netsuke that are just there for like tourists. They're mass produced. They're Mm. made of plastic and they're modeled after famous Netsuke. So they're like, what, like five bucks a pop or 10 bucks a pop or something like that. However, Uh. there are some that are incredibly expensive and some that are, they had to be taken out of circulation from collectors because they're made of ivory Uh, yes so they had to be relinquished is that the right word relinquished Uh, i believe (laughs) what do you mean i I would say that but yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) i believe it was like in 2013 when there was like a whole big thing about ivory and the ivory trade that people were given a certain amount of time to like relinquish their ivory goods their ivory products to 
the nearest museum. I don't know. Um. <laughs> Interesting. But that's because I, I, I feel like when I learned about it anyway, there was something like if it had been collected before a certain date, then it was considered kind of okay because it was during yeah. the, the legal time. But that's it, yeah. every, any, no matter what it was, you had to give it back in Japan. Like in yeah. So I don't know if it, it was no matter no matter when it was, but I know there was a big reclamation of ivory. Okay. And the most expensive Nitsuke was sold in the UK for 441,300 US dollars in December of 2022. And that was made of ivory and it was sold in the UK. And there was like some special rules about selling it because it was made of ivory, like it had to get approved about something or whatever. Uh But yeah, that's the, most expensive Netsuke ever purchased. I mean, that is crazy. And it was just a little, uh, and it's not big either, really. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> you want to guess what it was? Guess, guess, what? guess what it was. Guess what the, the, is, the Netsuke form was. <laughs> is it something like <laughs> phallic? Or, I don't no, know. no. <laughs> no, something cute. So silly. <laughs> something cute and so silly and so human. It's wild. <laughs> Like a, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know. Tell me, tell me, tell me. A shaggy little puppy dog, a oh. teeny tiny little puppy dog for four hundred thousand. <laughs> oh my goodness! I think it's like four centimeters tall and like three centimeters wide or something like that. This is teeny Whoa. tiny little puppy. <laughs> oh my goodness! Do you know where when it was from? I mean, was it particularly? old or yeah yeah it was from the edo period there wasn't a precise date on it but somewhere between the 16 and the 1700s okay then i can i mean i guess me but still (laughs) that's a lot for a little (laughs) carved puppy dog (laughs) i mean i'm sure they could have found a little carving of a puppy dog somewhere else for a (laughs) but then you wouldn't have the history you wouldn't have the story so i guess you know i can i can kind of understand it but and i mean that's how they're perceived in the in the present but i guess in the past if if it was just the standard way to wear your little the little pouch that you mentioned i'm afraid i forgot what it's called and the little pouch <laughs> or the little bag would would they also i mean i guess they wouldn't have been perceived as valuable back then or kind of special i don't know status <laughs> objects or anything like that or would they yeah, so the the history of the Netsuke is pretty cool. So in, in terms of like a status item. So at the beginning of the Edo period and a little bit before, around the beginning of the 1600s, they started to be made for the merchant class. During the Edo period, there was relative peace. Right before that was the Warring States period. So everything was like calming down. People started to like you know, do merchant thingies and trade and art was springing up. (laughs) You can tell you're a history teacher. (laughs) Merchant thingies. (laughs) You got to keep those kids interested. Right, Um, right. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Don't get too technical. It's a... I know what you mean. I know what you mean. (laughs) Thank you for understanding me. Um, So people, uh, you know, people were starting to make more money and move around and have things that they needed to carry. So the Netsuke were created to hold up the sagemono, those little pouches. And at the beginning, they were just like, Very simple, (laughs) really, really simple things. And then when the merchant class started to get more money, more money than the samurai class, because the samurai class were on fixed incomes and not all of them were making lots of money. But the merchants were able to make a lot more money because they were doing merchanty things. (laughs) And that's not a fixed income. (laughs) Not samurai things. (laughs) So their, their income was like going up. So they started wearing more fancy clothes and more, you know, flashy things, more silks instead of cottons, more intricate patterns on their stuff. And the Netsuke also started to become more fashionable. But then the Tokugawa shogunate, not important. You don't need to know who that is for this situation. Okay. Just know that 
<laughs> him, him and his group of samurai were like, we don't like it that you guys <laughs> are dressing all nice and fancy and we're over here not mm. fancy at all so mm. no more fancy things for you you cannot wear any fancy things you can only wear xyz you know okay. the fancy stuff is for us samurai so what happened is netsuke became kind of like the secret way to flaunt your money does that make sense? Oh, so you could be like, yes, I know I'm just wearing plain cotton, but check out my little puppy dog here. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and exactly. Check out my puppy. <laughs> no, no, not that one. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it was, yeah, sort of a, yeah, a subtle, a subtle hint at the wealth. I guess. Exactly. Exactly. Subtle hints at the wealth. You know, people, humans are, are like middle school students. All <laughs> humans are like middle school students, in my opinion. <laughs> like, you tell them not to do something, they're going to find right. a way to do that thing. Mm -hmm. And they're going to do it so creatively and so annoyingly well that you're going to be like, oh. I can't I can't punish you for this because you're doing exactly the thing that I said that you you shouldn't do, but in a way that I didn't anticipate. Ah, mm -hmm. so, yeah. finding yes. the loophole always. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but that's and I mean, does that mean then that people were kind of if they weren't necessarily allowed to buy them from places, were people making their own netsuke or were they still being carved by like, or were they ever carved by specialists actually? Or were they yeah, sort of yeah, homemade they, things? Some, sometimes at the beginning there were, you know, there were homemade things, but they were usually carved by specialists. Mm. And because the netsuke didn't fall under the rules for fashion, the they were able to be made by specialists and made really extravagant, really amazing, like really cool stuff. Oh, good. Yeah. Very nice. And, and made from, so you've already mentioned ivory. I yeah. believe some were made from wood that I had seen. Were there other, yes. like those kind of main materials? Were there, was there anything else? Yeah. So pretty, pretty much any carvable item was oh. used to make the Netsuke. So ivory, wood, stone, some metals were used. I was gonna, uh, and I was also gonna, okay. nuts. Like little oh. nuts. People used oh. little tiny nuts to make <gasps> cool little netsuke. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cute. And right. yeah, interesting with the with the metal. So that would have been cast, I guess, the metal. Yeah, yeah. Some of them were cast, some of them were were carved. Oh. Um, some of them, there's like, there's one really famous one that's more on the contemporary side okay. that is, uh, what are those big ground peppers? I think they're called. Oh, wow. Yeah. They're, they're like these big orange pepper looking things that are really famous in Japan. And there's one that's made of like glass and metal and has like a semi precious stone in the center of it. That's oh, wow. like pretty famous. Oh. So yeah, that, that's really cool. Yeah, very cool. Which mm -hmm. I guess, and I mean, but I suppose not everything could have been used as a Netsuke. They have like a special th thing that makes them a Netsuke rather than just a cool carving, like a glass pepper <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so, so the difference between just like a regular little tiny statue and a netsuke is basically the two holes at the bottom that's it makes sense yeah because you've got to attach the, the cord to attach the and i forgot it again sagimono so yeah sagimono you're doing it you're getting it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. i can add it to my japanese repertoire <laughs> i can ask for their phone number count very badly to 10 and say hey this random little pouch that probably isn't in use anymore um, <laughs> Oh, very cool. And just to double back a little bit, because at the moment, yeah. at the beginning, we mentioned men are the ones that are using the, the Netsuke. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason that women weren't, were they not allowed to use them? Was it kind of a gender divide thing? It was less that they weren't allowed to use it and more that kimonos, the, the kimonos that women wore mm -hmm. have long sleeves. So the, the men have long sleeves, but there's a lot of inner inner kimonos. So oh. if, if you picture a kimono, it looks like a T with like a really fat top part. Uh -huh. And inside of those sleeves, they could be used as pockets because, they, yeah, it's just a big 
giant pocket. So that's where a lot of women would carry their stuff. But some women did use sagemono and the netsuke, but it wasn't, it just wasn't as popular. But that's amazing that the Japanese culture got it right then. The men were the ones without the pockets. And the yeah, right. the pockets. <laughs> Listen up, rest of the world. This is how it should be. Get it together, guys. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to have another very quick break so that those who are listening in can have an opportunity to top up their tea, but we will be back soon. Welcome back, everyone. I hope the teacups are now fuller and the biscuit jar emptier. Although, actually, considering the time of year, maybe you're, you know, already moving on to your mulled wine and mince pies. Who knows? Ooh. <laughs> oh, man, I, miss, I need to get some. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we did already uh, introduce TK a little bit at the beginning of the section. We mentioned that she is a trained teacher, she's living in Japan, but maybe we could go into a bit more detail because although you are a qualified teacher, I believe at the moment you're not actually teaching history. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not actually teaching history right now. My my teaching career has been quite interesting. (laughs) So I I was an international school teacher for a while, but because of my husband's work, we've moved to a place that does not have any international schools. So I am now an online teacher of many things. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And so, because I know that quite a lot of people I mean, I, I, I know quite, <laughs> that sounds so, okay. I know some historians, but like, I do, I do, <laughs> I know some historians. I obviously mainly work with archaeologists yeah. and so many people, I imagine it's similar in history though. It's very difficult once you, if you're interested in the topic of archaeology or, or something related, once you graduate to then find something to be able to, for example, teach it and things. And even then the kind of job opportunities are not always there. So you find yourself having to do something else and then kind of, yeah do your hobby on the side um, in, right, in that respect. Right. <laughs> so, so, which you have managed to do very successfully with the podcast, I would argue. <laughs> but how, how do you find that balance or how do you kind of, yeah, how, how did you get to that point? So, I mean, it took a while. So after... Uh, forgive me for a, a, a small, small story right now. So I I graduated university with my degree in history and then my certification in teaching. And for one year, I was a history teacher. I was a seventh grade, which is middle school, first year middle school, world history teacher. And I loved it. And it was great. And then they offered me the job and they were like, you can do it. And I freaked out and I moved to Japan. So <laughs> classic tale. <laughs> so relatable. <laughs> and, and then, uh, you know, I started teaching English at a super science high school, which was focused mostly on science. And then another school focused mostly on like global studies. So that's what I did for four years. And then um, I moved to an international school for two years and I was the special education coordinator kind of it was my my hey we're a very small school and we don't have the kind of funding to have an actual special education coordinator could you also do this in addition to being the fourth grade homeroom teacher and I was like sure excellent (laughs) Yeah, that, that's how I've got many jobs, actually. Is by people right. going, I know you're already doing this and this and this, but what you might. Also, right. right. So, you know, it, when I when it was COVID time and I had been teaching, I think, for four and a half years, I had been doing nothing with history for four and a half years. I was like, hey, <laughs> I really like history and I'm really sad right now. So mm. why not start a podcast? And that that's what I did. So I, I, I told that whole story to get to the point of you can start doing the thing that you want to do at any point in time, even if you're doing something completely opposite to what it is you want to be doing, if that makes sense. And the only way that I know with my ADHD brain (laughs) on how to balance all that is planning the ever-loving 
bejesus out of my day. <laughs> yep. I'm sitting here next to my little planner, which okay. is now full of things because two days ago someone said, I'm so sorry, I forgot about our meeting today. And I looked and went, it's not written in my diary, therefore it doesn't exist. <laughs> <It's not. laughs> exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> plan, 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 plan. Yeah. If it is a, a, a paper diary that works for you, if it is Google Calendar that works for you, if it is a combination of both, which is what I use. <laughs> yeah, 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 nice. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. So planning, 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 and then get a lot of caffeine in your system. Both are great. <laughs> but no, I, I feel it very, so I also taught English for a while mm-hmm. oh, uh, yeah. after finishing my studies. I did ended up doing a master's in archaeology and then yeah, I couldn't, basically couldn't find a job and yeah, was right? trying things. And I had been qualified to teach English for a while because I had done that before. So I thought, oh, I'll do that. And I, I, I really love teaching. I mean, that's also why I do this podcast and that's yeah, why I yeah. do various social media things. I can imagine you're the mm-hmm. same. And, yeah. but yeah, I, I had the same thing that it was like, but I, yeah, I love teaching, but it's uh, passion. My passion is not the English language necessarily, or, you know, it's not this exactly. thing. My, yeah. I, what I want, what I would love to do is, you know, do this kind of teaching. So that's how it kind yeah. of started. And I imagine a lot of people are in, are in that situation. So mm-hmm. I think, uh, indeed, yeah, this is a nice, it's a, I think it's a good way. And I think that, yeah, TK demonstrates very nicely how you can, and you, your episodes are released quite regularly as well, right? Every two weeks, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I do, I go by season. So every week for about 10, between 10 and 12 weeks, just depending on how many like guests and episodes I have. So yeah, it's like full force for 10 to 12 weeks. And then I take a nice long break and then I go back at it. Yeah, <laughs> which is, yeah, probably a better way to do it than I'm doing it with the moment, which is just no, constant no. every month. But, um, <laughs> maybe I should do that. <laughs> I've been wondering whether to do that. Anyway, we'll come to that later. But, uh, but no, yeah. I think it's really, yeah, it's, it's a really great, uh, great example uh, to give. And I mean, history in general, uh, I guess it's, I mean, what, what would you say, is the kind of main important reason for you or, or your main kind of, what's the word, driving driving impetus or whatever to, to teach the history? Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, uh, when I started my podcast, it was out of loneliness. <laughs> I was, <laughs> it was the beginning of COVID. I was in another country. I was away from my family. I wasn't even able to teach at the time, really, because we were still trying to figure out all of the COVID-ness. And I... I just started looking up things about other plagues and the Spanish flu and things like that. And it made me feel a little bit better. That's what I, I think is really important about history is that being a human can be super, super lonely. And when we learn about all of the people that have come before us and have felt the same way, even, even if a hundred or a thousand years separate us and that, that, that other human, it's so nice to think that they thought and felt and had very similar things happen to them. And I think it makes life a little less lonely to know that fact. So I think that's one of the reasons why teaching history and learning history is so important. And another reason that I'm so passionate about history education is that I think knowing things brings understanding and empathy. So Mm -hmm. understanding another country, another, you know, part of the world's history allows for more empathy. Like, <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought you were preparing for your lecture. <laughs> I'm just dying. I'm just dying a little bit. Um, <laughs> Um, so my, my husband is Japanese and I'm American. And, and, you know, if, if, if you know anything about history, even right. tangentially, the history mm. between America and Japan is like not super cool. Mm. So it's to, to put it extremely lightly. So my, my husband and I often go to, World War II places like museums and and museums. Yeah. <laughs> you are your father's daughter, then. At the end of the day, 
So <laughs> we've, we've gone together to the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, and we've mm-hmm. gone to the Pearl Harbor Museum and Memorial in Hawaii. And then just three weeks ago, we went to the base where the kamikaze pilots right. yeah, yeah. were based and where they flew out of. Mm-hmm. And uh, my husband and I weeped, like wept. Mm reading the letters that these pilots wrote. And and for the longest time, I was like, why in the heck would anyone be a kamikaze pilot? Yeah. But now from going to this place, I understand. I mm-hmm. understand the history. So that's why I think history education is so important because it, 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 it breeds empathy, I think. Yeah. No, definitely. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I can imagine something, I mean, uh, the, I guess archaeology is generally more involved with, with longer periods in the past. And so a lot of people can argue, oh yeah, but it happened thousands of years ago. You know, it's irrelevant, but I guess something with history is, you know, it definitely is like it's, it, it happened recently enough to still be relevant to really relevant to modern society in terms of like even living memory or yeah, mm-hmm. something like that. So uh, yeah, yeah. I could not agree more. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of teaching, what would be your, your favorite topic to teach about? <gasps> <laughs> do you know the question where people are like if you had to give a ted talk right now what topic would you do <laughs> my ted talk is women samurai oh <laughs> i know i know because you know samurai are like it's like the manliest yeah. manly man activity that one could possibly do but yeah. <laughs> nay nay my friend <laughs> okay. there were I, many a lady samurai interesting like yes. it, and and sort of accept like not sort of rebellious lady samurais on the side but like respected as part of the samurai class oh yes oh yes 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 <laughs> and if i may be a little bit sp- I see. Some people very much do not agree, but it is arguable that the first samurai was a woman. See, mm-hmm. the more the more I hear about Japan, women had pockets. The first leader was an empress. <laughs> the first samurai was also a woman. I mean, <laughs> they're pretty progressive, I would say. Great as a country. <laughs> Do you happen to have a podcast episode out already about Eva Samurai? Oh, my friend, <laughs> I have three. How many I have three? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I have. I have one about like the general samurai women. I have one about Tomoe Gozen, and then I have one about this woman named Empress Jingu, who may or may not be the first samurai. But you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> I feel like I've heard that name before, but I uh, maybe I'm imagining things. I think I'm. Yeah. I'm getting confused. Who was the the female pirate again? What was her name? Oh, that was Cheng Yi Sao. Okay, no, that was someone else. That, oh, that's no, okay. Okay, but anyway, but, <laughs> but no, maybe. I mean that is a very interesting topic. I think, yeah, that, that uh, which out of curiosity, in terms of kind of modern Japanese history and how it's looked at, is is the study of history in Japan? kind of open-minded enough, I guess, to to consider these aspects? Or is it something that is still quite closed? It's, it's quite closed still. Okay. And not a lot of emphasis is put on women's history, unfortunately. Okay. But there's definitely like a very small group of archaeologists and historians that are working towards changing that narrative. I forget I forget the man's name, but he works for the University of Tokyo Waseda, I think. I think he works for them. And he is now working on a project to it might be over now. He either is working on a project or was working on a project to relook at some bones from a, a warring states period burial mound where a bunch of like samurai's bodies were buried uh-huh. to see if they were women. And indeed, uh-huh. one third of them were 
women. Amazing. I mean, it makes that's like the all of the you know, Viking studies that have been done, and turns out that a mm-hmm. load of the graves that were always considered male Viking warriors were actually women Viking warriors yes. instead. And yeah. So it makes sense that the same thing would also be happening in other cultures, like with it. Uh huh. You know, but yeah. Yeah. And I, I got an episode about that too. <laughs> you do. That's true. I listened to it. <laughs> we'll be putting links to all of these episodes, by the way, in the, in the show notes. Although, also, I would just highly recommend going through and listening to them all because there's some really very interesting. Uh, I mean, you think this is a specialized ed- episode? <laughs> wait, wait until you go and find some of the topics that TK talks about, which I've never heard of before. And then now oh, I know. I'm so wild. <laughs> no, it's great though. It's perfect for you know breaking the ice at those sort of parties. It's like, did you know? By the way, <laughs> there were females. Right? Wait, what? <laughs> if you have social anxiety, sit next to me at a party because I'll tell you some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that marks the end of our tea break today. It sounds like it's been a long, a long week or two for you. Uh, so I think uh, you probably need to have a bit of a sit down, rest, drink Thank some party tea, <laughs> um, swing some swords around. Um, yeah. <laughs> But thank you so, so much for joining me today, TK. I really, really appreciate it. It was great to hear hear from you. Thank you so much for having me. It was an absolute blast and happy to talk about this very niche, weird topic. <laughs> right? I'm so glad I found someone to talk about it with me. Yeah. So if anyone wants to find out more about TK's podcast, her other work, Netsuke, I'm going to say it right at some point, um, the history of Japan, <laughs> anything that we've been talking about, I will try to put all of the links into the show notes on the podcast homepage. I hope that you enjoyed our journey today. If you would like to help support this show and all of the other amazing series that form the Archaeology Podcast Network, you can become a member. You'll be helping us to create even more amazing content. You will also have access to ad-free episodes and bonus content like our quarterly online seminars, which look at different topics within archaeology, and you also get early access to episodes. So then you can already start talking about female samurai before other people have even heard about it, which, you know, (laughs) (laughs) for more information, check out the homepage, Archaeology Podcast Network network.com and i'll see you next month for another journey bye i hope that you enjoyed our journey today if you did make sure to like follow subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and i'll see you next month for another episode of tea break time travel this episode was produced by chris webster from his rv traveling the united states tristan boyle in scotland dig tech llc cultural media and the archaeology podcast network and was edited by rachel roden this has been a presentation of the archaeology podcast network visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com contact us at chris at archaeology podcast network.com